Okay, what I'm going to do now is start talking about the Java Executor Framework. And you'll get a chance to learn a lot of different things about how it works. First thing to remember is that the Java Executor Framework has a lot of pieces. This is a UML diagram, class diagram, or uh, structure diagram that shows all the various parts, or most of the various parts, that are in the Java Executor Framework. We're not obviously going to cover them all at the moment. But by the time we're done, you get a chance to learn about how most of these things actually work. You'll also learn about the different types of thread pools that are supported by the Java Executor Framework. There's three main types, and yet some other types that aren't as common, but three main types that are used. And you'll get to recognize a human known use of thread pool, which is kind of fun. All right, let's talk about the Executor Framework. So the Executor Framework provides lots of classes and lots of interfaces. And the main benefit that they provide, if you step back from the forest, from the trees and look at the forest, is that they decouple the creation and management of threads from the application logic and the tasks that it performs. So the idea here is that you're going to be able to de decouple the tasks to do from the way in which threads are created and which threads are managed. And the framework hides a lot of those details from you, so you can modify and change things without breaking a lot of your code. The way in which you access, the way in which you typically access the mechanisms that are provided by the executor framework is via this utility class called the executors class. And as we'll talk about later, the executors class has all kinds of factory methods that you can use to allocate various kinds of things. Uh, these factory methods will make different kinds of pools, and we'll talk about some of the pools that are provided here. You've already got a chance to play around with some of the stuff in earlier assignments. So obviously, we need to talk about what's a pool. So let's motivate why we need thread pools in the first place. Concurrent programs often have, typically have to handle large numbers of clients. Uh, if you build a server, for example, a web server, you may have to handle thousands of client requests simultaneously. So this is supposed to be a bunch of clients out there all accessing some big honking piece of hardware. However, it's usually a bad idea, even if you have a lot of hardware, to spawn a thread per client. So if you end up with thousands of clients, you don't want thousands of threads, typically. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is you typically don't have thousands of cores. Obviously, if you have thousands of cores, it may be a whole other issue. But often, it's the case that you have maybe a dozen cores, if that. And so if you have thousands of clients, you don't need thousands of threads, because thousands of things will not be happening simultaneously and you'll just be uh, bogging stuff down. Dynamically spawning a thread per client can incur an excessive amount of processing overhead, because you have to go ahead and create all these threads. And threads are not free to make. They, they take time. We've talked about that before in terms of the resources they allocate. And you can also, of course, consume an excessive amount of memory. So for each thread, you not only have to make it, but it also has to take up space. So those are two different things you'd really like to avoid. Therefore, a more effective way of scaling up the system's performance is by using a thread pool. So you're going to have a pool of worker threads. And this is beneficial because it amortizes the memory and processing overhead associated with spawning threads. So we don't spawn a thread for every client. We typically spawn a fixed number of threads or maybe a dynamically sized set of threads that can grow to a certain limit, which is not one for every client. And you can decide how big to make the pool by various factors, like the number of cores you have, how I.O. intensive your tasks are versus compute intensive, and so on. Does anybody remember the, the main difference between I.O. intensive tasks and compute intensive tasks with respect to the number of, of threads you want to have in your pool? What's the main differ differentiation between an I.O. intensive task and a compute intensive task. You split up the compute one, but not like the IO is CPU bound. Actually, IO is not CPU bound. Com compute intensive is CPU bound. You can either only use IO operations on the same core. Right. And what's the reason for that? Exactly. So Austin's observation, which is correct, is that with I.O. intensive tasks, an awful lot of time, 
the thread is blocked waiting for I.O., or you know, either writing something or reading something from a slower mechanism, a slower media, right, like a disk or a network or flash memory, anything that's slower than memory, main memory. And so as a result, when the thread is blocked, then another thread can run. Whereas with a compute-intensive operation, or CPU-intensive, um, those things just run. And so they typically don't stop unless they stop themselves voluntarily. So as long as something's running in a compute-intensive way, then you're going to uh, not benefit from having lots of threads. Spawning lots of threads that are compute-intensive is pointless because only as many threads will possibly run as there are cores. Whereas with IO-intensive, as Austin pointed out, they can be interleaved more effectively. So the Java Executor framework provides a number of different ways to organize thread pools. One common way, which we've looked at, is to use a fixed size pool where you have a fixed number of threads. And the idea here is you amortize the creation of threads. Here's a very simple example from our web server. We make a fixed size thread pool, and then we go ahead and we execute. Uh, let's say we make it with size four. And then irrespective of how many client requests come in, we're going to call execute, but only four of those things will be running at a time. Uh, and that might actually be a bad way to do a thread pool for a web server, because you might want to have a little bit of flexibility, because if you have you know, four cores, these threads may be blocked in, in uh, I.O. for some period of time. So you might want to make it bigger. You might want to make it eight as opposed to four. As work comes in and there's not a thread available because it's off doing something else, they are simply going to be queued up in some kind of work queue and then processed at some later point. Another way to do things is to use a cache thread pool where threads are created on demand in response to client workload. So we do that by the new cache thread pool factory method. As you can see here, similar looking logic, but every time execute is called, it'll go ahead and create a new thread if there isn't one already. Now, that also may be a problem as well, because uh, if you have lots of clients show up, you could end up creating th hundreds or thousands of threads, right? This could end up being about as bad as the um, earlier approach with spawning a thread per client. So that could be a problem. If the threads are not used for a certain amount of time, like, say, a minute, then they can be shut down, or a second or whatever, they can be shut down automatically. Yet another mechanism is called a fork join pool. And this supports, this uses double-ended queues, decks, and this supports what's called work stealing. So what happens is, uh, normally a thread is allocated to a deck and it sits there and it reads things off the head of the deck and runs. But when a thread burns through everything in its deck, rather than just sitting there idly, it goes and it finds other decks and steals their work from their tail. And that reason they steal from the tail is because that doesn't compete with the other thread that's trying to steal, that's trying to do the work from the head. So if this thread, if this deck is long, is long, or has more stuff than this deck, then when this guy runs out, he will go over here and steal work from the end of some other deck. And that the idea here is to keep the system running as uh, with as high utilization as possible. So something is always being processed. There's also lots of other ways to implement thread pools. There's a few other ways that Java supports, and then there's also other mechanisms like half sync, half async, and leader followers, and so on. So the point is that you can make your own thread pools. If you don't like the ones that Java provides, you can make your own using your own techniques. Quick human known use of a thread pool is a call center. So undoubtedly, you've all dealt with call centers at one point or another you need tech support or you need having problems with your credit card bill or you're trying to get tax advice or whatnot and you call up a number and that number then is basically a front end to a bunch of people who sit around with headphones on and talk to customers and uh, obviously you don't have a customer representative for every person who calls in and the reason you know that is because you spend a lot of time on hold waiting for the next available operator and waiting for the next available operator is basically the same idea as having a pool of threads and work is then shared and things sit in a queue, like a, a call queue, until someone is available to do the work. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the Java Executor.